Welcome to another episode here at Lighting Bot. Uh, we have Michael Tansilo joining us uh, in a few minutes. Uh, he is obviously a quite interesting character, having been an author, lighting artist, and currently being a 3D artist at Substance Adob, which was, will be interesting to kind of investigate what he's doing right there. Uh, just a reminder for everyone, uh, being part of the Lighting Bot community, you can like, subscribe, and join. Uh, we do have a couple of things I'll point out later on, but for now, let's get Michael into the talk and find out what he has been doing before and what he's doing right now. Welcome, Michael. Hi, everybody. How's it going? Right, that's cool. So, obviously, I remind everyone you can ask questions. Uh, if it's uh, relevant questions and not like some weird stuff, we'll put it up on the screen and, and ask the questions, but that tends to be not a problem. So, Michael, uh, for people who don't know about you, let's, uh, let's introduce you. Let's, Let's start from the beginning. You know, where did you start? What happened under the way? Let's let's kind of figure out what happened. Uh, why you yeah, ended sure. up how, 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 did I, how did I get in this situation? <laughs> uh, yeah. yeah. So I am a yeah. Okay. So to start things off, I was just a student who was um, confused as to what I wanted to do in life. I was uh, got into photography in college, and I started studying because um, I was obsessed with the photographic process. Uh, you know. It, uh, you know, this is before digital photography, so it was all uh, film, processing film by hand, processing uh, the prints by hand. So it was all the chemical mixtures of, of getting your certain looks and the physical act of burning and dodging images to make certain areas lighter or darker to get your composition. I got very into color photography, so dialing in the RGB and CMYK values of, of a color print was really cool. I just, I just, I just loved the whole process. And while I was doing that, I took a 3D modeling class in college, mostly because I was working at an art gallery at the time and somebody presented a, uh, an option of, 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 of displaying their artwork by modeling the gallery and then putting their artwork in different places. This was probably in 2002. And I was, I was blown away by that. I'd never seen anything like that. So I was like, man, I got to. I, I, my artwork is not the best, but if I present it well, maybe I can get into some cool art shows. And so I did that. Um, so I, I learned, I learned the 3d process, just 3d modeling and making some simple stuff. I got really into it. Uh, I started to look into this as an idea for a job. And then I watched finding Nemo, uh, and, and in the behind the scenes of finding Nemo, there was these lighting artists going scuba diving off the coast of Australia to help define the look of the film. Cause the way the water looks in open ocean looks very different than when they get closer to Sydney and that plays into the emotional effects of the film. And I was just blown away by that process. So I looked into it more, I started studying, applying for jobs, not getting any of them. And uh, I, I decided that it was, it was best for my development to go back to grad school. So I went to this, I got into the Savannah College of Art and Design where I studied for a few years and then eventually got a job as a Lighting technical assistant, which is a glorified render wrangler at Blue Sky Studios. Um, so that was after grad school. And then I worked at, I had a really lovely time working for uh, 12 and a half years at Blue Sky Studios. I uh, started as a technical assistant, uh, made my way up through the lighting department um, and worked on, uh, I think it was 10 total films in my time there. And then, yeah, and then, and I, because of, uh, Blue Sky Studios shut down. <laughs> it was closed by by Disney, and so uh, I since then I was able to land a really great job with uh, Adobe, working on uh, Substance Painter, Designer, Stager, and what was formerly Alchemist is now called Sampler. So all right, yeah. so quite the full background. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's it's, it's it's quite interesting. Um, so obviously you have done bit of teaching and you still do a bit of teaching on your own obviously uh so what is interesting to kind of figure out is we'll work our we'll work backwards now so you're a 3d artist at adobe right now so how come you picked that and why didn't you continue being a lighting artist specific yeah. why didn't you even do more on academy of animated art the the teaching institute you also have uh, What's your mind process? What happened there? What's yeah. the decision making? So um, it was it was all so after your you know you and four hundred of your closest friends get laid off, it makes you go through a little bit of a uh, a time to reevaluate where you are in your career. And I recently read something that was uh, make your career about something, and then as opposed to making it 
about the individual job or, 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 or a job title that you want. Make it about a quest or a journey or a, 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 a more of an abstract destination. Uh, an example would be like, you know, make your career about helping people or about. So for me, being a 3D artist, being a lighting artist changed my life. It, it gave me a, a fulfilling career I never, ever expected. And so for me, it was all about, I, I determined that I wanted to do something that would help. I just wanted to help people get into this industry and help people get into 3D because it can be really difficult to learn. And there's not a, there's a ton of resources, but not all of them are great. And so just making resources that are approachable, understandable and applicable to the jobs and really helping other people get, get there was, was very important to me. So after Blue Sky closed, I planned on just taking some freelance projects, but really focusing on the Academy of Animated Art, my, the online school uh, that I started with Jasmine Katatakarn a bunch of years ago. We can talk more about that later, but I wanted to just teach and focus on that. And then uh, through... We, I was doing some collaboration work, and I, I, you guys may know him. You know, do you know the website, The Rookies? Yeah, you familiar? Yeah. So Alan Hunt, uh, I, I worked with him uh, through my online school in The Rookies, and we colla- we were collaborating on a project, and he was just talking to me about. He mentioned Adobe and Substance like three times in a sentence or something weird, and I was like, "Why do you keep talking about Adobe?" And he's like, "Oh, I, I work there now," and he said that, and he kind of described what he was doing with the team and uh and i was like oh that's really cool and i didn't think much about it It just kind of planted a seed in the back of my head so i reached out to him later and i was like hey are you guys hiring and by chance they were and so uh i talked to my now my my supervisor now and one of the things that he said because he was talking about because i wasn't sure if this was a job that i wanted to go back into and he said you know we're here we our, our goal with the substance products is to make them simple to use uh, approachable and so that we can get more people involved in 3d and i was like it was like a, a light bulb went off in my head during that interview process because i was like oh that fits what i want to do and so i can I, I do that uh yeah so i i found a great fit for what i wanted to do and so right now my job is is mostly showcasing 3d tools and and, and being an artist for companies that want to get into it so i've been i've been working with a ton of artists across a bunch of different industries with very different backgrounds. Some are 2D artists, some are CAD modelers, some are that have been like really teaching them and, and getting them into the process. So that's, that's how I kind of ended up is I, I kind of, I have a mission uh, for my career that I want to, I want to help people get into this industry and, and learn this craft as much as I can. That's good. So what I'm curious to know is now you're doing more 3D artist type of mm-hmm. work. Uh, did you keep yourself up to date in those areas of skill set or did you have to pick up some stuff as yeah. selecting artists from my point of view but i'm a very slow learner uh, I have spent <laughs> a lot of time just learning you know lighting specific things that means i'm not touching 3d modeling i'm not touching sure. 3d animation i'm yeah. really just getting uh by so i read your book a couple of years ago already uh i think Somewhere, somewhere around the time you released it was mm-hmm. one of the books. I even used it in my teaching when I was teaching at the university. Oh, cool. I was like, shit, I'm just going to use this stuff from the book. Oh, great. <laughs> perfect. Yeah, perfect. <laughs> so, so, so it's a lot of work just doing teaching, as you know, and also keeping up. So what happened there with the 3D artists? Was it easy for you to get into it or did you? Uh, you know? Yeah, so I mean, I definitely did not keep up with it. I definitely focused on being a lighting artist. Uh, and even more than that, we used proprietary tools at blue sky so proprietary renderers proprietary you know other than we use nuke um but but it was it was we 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 created our own tools for it so coming out of that environment was very intimidating because i didn't i i i'd done some side projects and taught in arnold a little bit i hadn't touched any gpu renderers i hadn't i hadn't even worked in um i hadn't even worked in substance painter in years and, and it was, it was just kind of picking that, like my first step was picking up the products that I was going to be working with and then getting into, and now because of the, the different fields that I work in there, you know, you work with automotive, they do, they, they have different, they have different needs, fashion have things like Clo and browseware and marvelous designer, which I'm just not used to. So I'm, it's, it's exciting because it's constantly helping me pick it up. But what, what I teach and what I truly believe is that the software is just a tool. And honestly, once you kind of get the concepts of 3D under your belt, 
um, every it, it all comes pretty easily. It's all just like, oh, they do it this way. They have this functionality. They emphasize these things. Um, it's all it's it's all it's all pretty straightforward once you get your head wrapped around the concepts. Right. So for everyone watching, uh, there's a quite a few. Uh, for people on twi Twitter, uh, you're gonna have to. Uh, right on the thread and I'm manually looking for your questions there but I will be focusing more of my question towards the educational parts and other parts for lighting related uh, if you guys have any specific questions uh, I will let you guys and girls ask the questions uh, but before we do that I just want to show his show reel so you guys get some inspiration on in case you don't know some of the stuff he's done it's kind of you know helpful to know so we're just gonna run the show reel a little bit just to show off uh, and then uh, hopefully you guys will get some uh, question inspiration uh, so uh, let's have a watch Yeah, that's a smart ending right there when it goes off. <laughs> <laughs> I only had one shot at, at rendering that. That that was like the last shot of the that was the last shot of the last Ice Age movie that we made, and uh, and I I remember we were out of I was out of time and I just I had like one shot at rendering that whole thing because that was a huge render and it was just kind of like it was a real hail mary shot. It was a, worked out okay. <laughs> Yeah, I think it looks very good. Very good. So just to include our viewers, one of your students, I believe, uh, Kat Loveland. Oh, yeah. uh, <laughs> How's it going? Very eager student on LinkedIn yeah. as well. Yeah, uh, so some light demon, uh, Aaron, I believe. It's also uh, oh, yeah, hey, Aaron, how's it going? see you pop up. So we'll pop up a few more as time yeah. passes on. Uh, so... I think it's uh, obviously you have a, a quite a, quite a background. I think it's safe to say that uh, 
some of us at least if not half of us probably watch some of the movies that you've lit as well without knowing it until you until we show the video now i guess so uh, definitely definitely good what i would like to address a little bit as well is being um, into lighting and also teaching lighting it's interesting to get your perspective because something that a lot of people challenge with when they are doing anything visual in this case, but I'm obviously emphasizing lighting, but it doesn't really matter in this context, is is sharing their work and getting their feedback from other people. Um, what are your thoughts about it? And how do you, yeah, what are your thoughts about it? Let's start with that. How, wh what do you think is important of getting feedback? And why do you uh, think people are afraid of getting feedback? I mean, I listen. This, I could talk about. I could talk about this for the rest of the time. Um, I think I, a few things. Let's I do. think. I think. <laughs> I think critiques are absolutely crucial to artistic development. So I'll start. I'll start there with that and say that you can sit at home or even in a classroom and and sit in on as many lectures as you want. You can watch any demo that you want. You can duplicate anything that you want, but it's only through the process of creating something getting feedback on that from a professional who knows and then making those improvements do you actually do you do improve fat more, more quickly than you would otherwise because so many times and and I, I can only speak for myself but there were so many times coming up when you know you know what you're supposed to create right you see these films you see other people's work you know what you know what the benchmark is and you know that the work that you're creating isn't there yet but you don't know why you you like there's a there's a gap between what you can see and what you can kind of process. And so um, it's really frustrating to not have that critique cycle to be able to show someone and say, oh, this could be improved by, you need more color variation in the shadows. Do you see how the fill side of the face is getting really flat? Do you see how the character's not popping off in the background because their tonality is the same or their hue is or whatever, whatever the thing is. Cause then it, that's when it really clicks. And for me, like coming into blue sky, just sitting I, early on when I was a render wrangler, I would just sit in on lighting rounds and just like watch the feedback loop happen, even though I wasn't participating in it, just like understanding that was so important. And then once you get in it, you be, you become better and better very quickly. Now, why is it hard for people? It's really, really personal. So you, it's, it's scary. And I, I, I try and make a point when, cause I do uh, regular critiques with our, with our students is that is, I, 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 I always recognize how hard it is to put yourself out there because it's something that you're, you're, you're creating and you're, and you're putting out there to, to be, I mean, like literally criticized in a critique. Uh, and so we are really uh, respectful and, 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 um, and everybody in the industry for the most part is there's some, there's some difficult critiquers that uh, uh, will, will make it, We'll, we'll make it personal, but 99.9% .9 of the, the interactions that I've had have been uh, productive. We, we try and be very productive and very tough, but also very respectful of the process. And, and because I, I know how difficult that, that can be. And how do you do Cause um, there are always some students who are not necessarily aware of their own progress or, mm -hmm. or uh, aware of that they they still have a lot of way of go and they, they feel they've done a lot because of uh, for whatever reason and i am sure during your time uh, so far and <laughs> you're going to continue experience it i'm sure those type of students how do you deal with them and how do you kind of keep pushing them to learn more yeah. and you know, because deep down, it's, you kind of know they have a lot more to go and yeah. you don't want to discourage well, them. How, how you, do you do that? You recognize realistic goals for each project. Like, you know that if somebody's just starting and it's the first time they're lighting a character, that it's it's not going to be, uh, it's it, you know, it's it's not it's not going to be the greatest thing in the world. Like I said, the the, the somebody told me this once that all of us have 10,000 bad drawings in us. And we just, the faster we can get those out, the faster we can get to the good ones. And I feel that way about 3D as well, that you have, especially if you're learning something for the first time, you have to go through a few iterations of the process and just going through the process and getting, getting an image as far along as it can is the success. And now it may, it won't show up on your demo reel. It won't, you know, that's, but it's, it's the important step to get to the next phase. So with some projects, you know, like I just, I just know where, you know, we're a small enough community. I know all the students, I know where they are in their development. And for each one of them, it's like for this project, let's get it to this point. Okay, cool. 
because other, otherwise you just start spinning your wheels a little bit. Like if we spent like, you know, if, if, if the very first project I try to get it up to, um, you know, professional demo real worthy quality, it would just be, I would just be pounding. It, it would just, it would exhaust the student. So it's like, you get it up to as good as you can. You like for, for your art, for your artistic level at this point with this file, this is the best that this can be. Let's do something else. Cause it's like you jump with each project in your ability to do it a little better each time. So how much do you say, would you say when someone or anyone really in this context gives a critique or feedback, how much responsibility of uh, uh, troubleshooting or doing some research and learning on your own is lies on the student versus the teacher? Yeah. I think, I think, I think the, for, for me, the way that I approach it is I, I, don't like to lean I, I f f from the student standpoint because there's so many resources out there for technical solutions and like problem solving like every renderer has a forum or a discord server or somewhere where you can ask questions and, and 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 talk to like their software engineers directly and honestly like so much of that stuff is individual project base and and, and figuring out those problems so I, I put a lot of that on our students and, and they reply really respond really well to that for me i i try and be like the art director or the the uh, person giving the aesthetic feedback and really really focusing on on what can make a better image now when i when i do talk that through i'll talk about like how to get that way you know it's it's like a like cat loveland is is working on a project now where we were talking about you know it's a nighttime scene we're outside, there's like a gravel road. And so we're, we're talking about like, it would be really cool if we picked up some specular highlights from like some rocks and maybe some debris in that, in that gravel, in that dirt road. And how do we do that? Like, oh, what if we just made the dirt road instead of a dirt, making it like metallic and then making a, uh, making some mats of just the rocks and then isolating the rocks with the metallic and then mixing that in the, in the comp with a different path. Like, finding those solutions I'll help with, but it's like, I'm not gonna, you know, it's on the student to be like, oh, I'm, you know, to, to, if they're going through that process of like, oh, wait, this is failing with this render error. Like, I don't always know the render error stuff. Um, so that, that, can, that can fall on the students. It's mostly, it's mostly, yes. Yeah. She's saying she's working on it as she's looking Good. Good, we've got critique in a little while. Get it, get it right. <laughs> yeah. <there. laughs> so how about yourself though, uh, having been, uh, for example, at the, um, um uh, blue sky studios for about 12 years um almost 13 i think mm -hmm. um did you ever continue yourself getting feedback or did you reach a level where you are like I, i'm confident i don't necessarily need feedback or or how does that work what kind of person are you in that context I, and and uh, yeah the more the more I, you i need you need feedback everybody does there's no there's there's no artist that i work with that doesn't uh require feedback mostly uh, because of the, you're working, when you're working on a film project, you are working towards somebody else's artistic goal in a way, right? Like you're working towards the art director, or the director, you're working to their goal. So it doesn't matter how great your image looks. If it doesn't, cause you're just helping them tell the story that they want to create. You're just one part of it. So, so you can be in sync with that director. You can be in sync with that art director and know generally what they look for and provide those, that look, uh, for, for it. But, but ultimately they're going to have, have notes on what they want and getting that feedback is really great. And actually the longer that I went along, the more open I was to the critique process because I, I, you get more confident in your abilities and you get more, um, uh, you get, you start to feel a little bit, uh, you feel a little bit better about the process. So I would just reach out. So uh, Jasmine uh, Katatakarn, who's my co-founder of the Academy of Animated Art, she, she sat like six feet away from me. And so I, we, we would we would constantly be working like this with headphones on and then pop them off and be like, hey, and we would just say, can I get your eyes on this? And then she would come over and be like, hey, what, what do you think of X, Y, and Z? And having good artist friends and mentors and colleagues who can be honest with each other is the most important thing. So th there was a trust there between me and the other artists to be honest with each other if we didn't like something or if we thought something could be better. Because it's all about, like, it's not a critique of you, it's all about making the work better. That was a long-winded right. answer to that. But it's both, mostly like the, the more that I did it, the more I, I leaned on critiquing to help improve my work. So um, according to your experience, because obviously um, you started 
a few years uh, before me, so you're, you're technically my senior as well. Uh, how would you deal with the the, the art director, for example? Like, because you, as a as a specialist, obviously. Mm -hmm probably have your opinion your your style you know because you can't get away from your own style even though you're working from different projects i've experienced especially on set when you do cinematography mm -hmm. you know there's a certain style to every director of photography and you know and there's a certain style behind this so how do you deal with uh if you believe something is better uh, mm -hmm. but the art director is saying no i want this do you make an effort to uh, yeah. you know to, to i don't know <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. It's a great question. So, and that's one that we get a lot because there's a, a point in every film that I've ever worked on where I can point at the screen and say, that wouldn't look that way if it wasn't for a thing that I tried. And the key to doing this is to be respectful of that. And, and, and the easiest, so let's say art director is looking at your shot and says, this shot needs to, like the character needs to be brighter and the background needs to be darker. And you're like, I actually think the character, I think it would look better if the character was darker and the background was brighter. The last thing you want to do is take their note and do the opposite and just come back with it because it does not matter how good it looks. They're just going to look at that. Because think about, think about what you would do. You would look at that and go, that's not what I asked for. I asked for the exact opposite of that. So my secret weapon of that is we would call them alts or like alternative versions of it. And I, I love doing this. I treat rounds like their presentation like I, like it's like it's almost like a uh, very rapid fire presentation so you'll show it and you'll be like okay here i here's that shot from yesterday you said you wanted the character to be brighter and the dark round to be darker so here we go here's that i also have version b can we please show version b with that is inverted and then like or or if it's like we need the character to feel more blue and like i'm kind of struggling with the note i'll be like hey i've got like five versions of of this shot with and I've just increased the saturation of the blue on the character. Can you just tell me like where what level you want that to be at? So it's it's about hearing their note, addressing it, and then giving them options. Uh, either either if you're struggling with the note and you you want you you need a little more guidance, just make a wedge. I'm a big fan of making a wedge test of something, and then providing like you know what I just I, I had a feeling like this might work, so I made this alternate version. What do you think about it? Because it, it's it, there, there's it's super low stakes at that point because you show it to them and they can either be like, "That's great, let's actually do that," or they can also be like, I, "That's yeah. not what I want. Let's go back." Or let's combine. Oh, let's combine them and do take this. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, a little bit, a little bit from this, a little bit from that. So just to, because I'm pretty sure a couple of the people that I know are watching don't know what a wedge test is. So do you want to? Oh, yeah. Ex explain what yeah. it is. So basically, it would be like if. Um, Think about, it. I'm trying to think of a good example. So one example would be, I know the fur artists at Blue Sky use wedge tests a lot. And they would be like, okay, so we need to make this character with curly hair. How curly do you want it? And they would run a test where they would animate the variable of hair curl, let's say from zero to one. And like, you know, you know, there would, so there'd be a render where it'd be like totally straight, then 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.4, 0 0.5, 0 0.6, 0 0.7, 0 0.8, 0 0.9. I, I curled too quickly, but... Um, you, you get the idea and then and then you'll go back through the frames and you'll look at 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0.3. And the director will be like, oh, we want it, we want it kind of between 0 0.3 and 0 0.4. So then 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 you go back and you set it to 0.35 and you go on. So a wedge test is uh rendering something in increments that you know what those increments are so that you can so that you can look at it and be like, that's what I want, that's too much, that's too little, and then you can so in in the context for the for the lighting artist or people doing lighting in yeah. general uh, it would be for example different intensity uh, contrast yeah. so you kind of know the numbers this was 0 0.5 this was 1 mm -hmm. this was 1.5 all right um, or, or or if you want to put a rotation on a key like i would do that sometimes too it's like if you if we knew we wanted the key to come in from the what am I right from? like the screen left side i would i would i would put the aim on my nose and then do a wedge test with the key kind of rotating around right. this way. And then we can take, take a look at it and figure out which angle would be best or something like that. Nice. Very good. Tola says it's uh, that's a really good way to approach that situation. Um, thanks for the comment, Tola. So, yeah, I mean, there are obviously different ways to approaching all of these things. Um, I do similar things at work where I give like alternative, normally just one because I'm the only one. So I don't have a lot of time to do yeah. a lot. Uh, so that's a that's a good way to approach uh, the art director because I, I think 
because I get a lot of questions. It's a lot of Discord chat about like how do we deal with you know different personalities, different art directors, and <laughs> how do we convey things and incorporate because collaboration is is a big thing uh, in our industry uh, as well. I think so. Well, when you were doing it, uh, work at Blue Sky Studios, and you were also doing, I believe. Uh, yeah, you started co-funding Academy of Animated mm -hmm. Art kind of halfway through, give or take. Yeah. Uh, so so what made you do that? What made you take that sure. leap and say, okay, now I'm going to help people and <laughs> I'm going to make my busy schedule even more busier <laughs> and my life even harder? What happened? Sure, 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 sure. Uh, it was not a desire to make my life harder. It was, uh, no. So um, it started because Jasmine and I independently had started, we'd gone on recruiting trips for work to colleges and stuff. And one of the things that we were noticing was that it was pretty, it was pretty glaring because the problem was, is that even, and this was even at the best schools where the work was, the students weren't in a position to be competitive, like to really compete for lighting jobs at major companies. They're, they just, the, the work just wasn't there yet. And in talking to the students, um, there just was kind of a, they were way too focused on the software and they were like, Oh, you know what? I'm, if I just learned V-Ray, if I just learned Mental Ray at the time or whatever, like whatever the thing, the hot new thing was, then my images will look better. And you're looking at the images and you're like, no, there are some fundamental uh, issues with, with color and composition. And, and I also know that like in my head, working back at our studio, we, we didn't have the fanciest, we didn't even have a GUI for our renderer. All of our renders were done through a text editor, but, a, but you realize in the industry that like the tools are just tools, like artists and good artists can make any, anything look good with anything. So, so it was, it was, and, 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 you know, just, just, just talking to the students, talking to the schools, there was a gap. And so we knew that the things that they were learning in school weren't the things that were helping them get jobs. And I, I remember Jasmine and I were just, we'd talk about it and we were like, well, what if, what, like, what things would we teach? And we were like, we teach them how to shape a character. We teach them how to separate a, a character from the background. We teach how to light a character's eyes. We teach, how to create mood in your lighting and in different situational stuff. And then we started just like brainstorming it. And, and that's, that's where it came from was this um, also this desire to, to make a program that, that actually taught the light for students that wanted to get it become lighting artists. Like what are the things that you have to know and what are the things you have to be good at to impress on the demo reel? Uh, so we started there and then we, 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 we made some other decisions. We knew it wanted, we wanted it to be online. Um, because we wanted to be accessible to more people. It was a, a big thing was for students getting into certain schools, like they didn't have, like a lot of people didn't live in those areas and couldn't afford to live in San Francisco and go to these great schools, right? So it was like, let's make it online so we can make it cheaper and, and, and more affordable to people. We also make all of our lectures pre-recorded so they can be watched anytime, day or night, because we have students all over the world. We have, um, we have students that are working during the day and can only watch at night. We have, we have people with just life obligations. So that, that stuff came into it, but, but, the, and then, and then for Jasmine and I, like I came out of grad school with a mountain of student loans um, that, you know, was the only way to do it at the time. And so we, we wanted to keep the price lower so that, because that, that we, you just, you, there should be a system where you can learn this stuff without going, Without, without without going broke in the process yeah totally yeah yeah for sure uh so uh, so how was the process of doing this because uh, we also have as far as i did my research we also <laughs> have uh, first of all during my research i found out the school was originally called td slash u or something yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah so, it was it was called tdu but as you can imagine tdu.com was it was taken and being squatted on by somebody it's not i don't think it's like ever actually used uh, so they wanted to, they tried to charge us like $50,000 or something crazy. For, anyway, so we just did td-u.com. Um, and then it was, it, it ended up it, because we were the technical director of university, like lighting TDs, we we're going to do material TDs, that kind of thing. Right. Um, and then the industry kind of changed the terminologies a little bit. So TD was more of a pipeline job and there was some confusion there. So that's where we switched to the Academy of Animated Art to be a little bit more clear about our intentions. So, All yeah. right, that's cool. Yeah. So you also have models, I believe, part of the students. You could either we could either buy some of some of them are free, obviously. Mm -hmm. Some of them can be purchased. I think it's twenty five dollars or something. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you also have so these models 
uh, are there friends of yours or did you make a licensing or how did you approach <laughs> yeah. the accessibility because i feel one of the advantages uh, of 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 uh, why people should go to your um, mm -hmm. school is, 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 is they get different things they can quickly practice on, right? Because that's uh, one of the disadvantages, uh, not for people like us, because we work mm -hmm. in uh, uh, Unreal Engine, so there's a lot of free content. But mm -hmm. for you guys who work in Maya, I've quite often heard, I don't know what to pick, uh, I don't know what to do. So, yeah. so how was that thought process? So that was, um, that came out of, out, out of our own struggles learning. I'm a, I'm a pretty, pretty terrible, uh, I, I was, I was a pretty terrible modeler. Um, I was, I'm not an, I'm not an animator. I stink at animation. So for us, it was all about, and so often when you go to light a project, you need something there for you to light. And so you, you can, you go through this process of struggling artistically to create a model that's, that looks good. And then, and then you just run out of time to light things properly. So it was a big goal of ours to provide characters, environment, scenes, uh, animated stuff to our students so that they had, like you said, they had, they, they could just download it. It's got textures on it. It's ready to go and away it goes. Uh, and you can just focus then on your lighting. In terms of finding people, we got very lucky early on. We met a woman named Sarah Tarr who is, lives in Australia. She created many of our assets. She still is. She's phenomenal um, and, and really, really does a, a, a brilliant job with it. We, we also have others that have contributed. Uh, we've got some really, really great stuff through, again, yeah, it's all just through connections in the industry and friends. That's good. Uh, yeah, and, and it's, but the, but the goal of it is for our students to have access to, uh, to, to a, just a bunch of models, characters, things to like. And so, so we, I mean, we also have, we have our marketplace where you can buy those individually, even if you're not a student. But if you are a student in our like lighting for animation, core program you have access to all of our lighting challenges and a whole like you know 30 or 40 different characters and scenes and stuff so. Hmm. uh so a lot of work obviously goes into this naturally uh how do you balance your time because a lot of people also want to know like how do you balance your time because you are juggling quite a few things mm -hmm. so so what's your what's your secret um there there's there's, I mean, the, the secret to me early on when I was doing this stuff was just discovering that I really have a passion for helping people. So like, obviously I, I focus on my, my day job during the day. And I, so it's, it's evenings, lunch hour, things like that. It's very I'm, important to specify that you do focus on your job. I do focus on my job. <laughs> anyone from Adobe is listening. I do, I do. Um, no, but it's, it's, it's really about like at the it's going to sound so, so silly, but it was like, I, I cut out, you know, just, just like just being on my phone, doing nothing time or, you know, like watching exactly. TV. I mean, I still like, I, at the end of the day, I even have two little kids. I put the kids to bed. I just pull out the laptop. I I've got my, I'll, I'll watch uh, squid games or whatever I've got on. And I just, you know, I, I'll do some work on that. I'll collaborate with a few people uh, during the day, during my lunch hour, I'll do the, the student critiques. And I'll hop online and, and, and critique some work, work with some students that way. And, and a, bi a big part of it too, I must say, is that the community that we built at the Academy of Animated Art, we have a ton of students now who are brilliant. And they, they you know, like, it's not, it's not always just about me interact. It's like them interacting with each other and helping each other out and bouncing ideas off of each other. So, so our students help out a lot. But, but for me, the, the secret, the secret sauce is, you know what? I'm gonna tell. This is, this is gonna be my secret sauce thing. It's just learning to say no to things that aren't important. I think that right. we we've got we've gotten really good at that of being like, uh, you know, that you you you're offered more than you can always take on in this industry. True. But True. but you so you just like you say like this is what I want to do. This is not what I want to do, and you just say yes, uh, yes to the uh, things that are. And every and every time I say no, I think to myself, I'm saying no so I can say yes to something else. Right, right. I agree with that. I also started uh, saying no to a lot of freelancing. Do you do any freelancing by any chance? Or is it just just not the, at the, the moment, Academy no. of Art? Okay, cool. Yeah, that's 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 my my freelancing gig. And then, yeah, it's just it's maybe maybe somewhere down the road. But for now, yeah, for now it's that's good. Me. That's me saying no. <laughs> Definitely useful. So, if you were to give uh, three advice tips to uh, students, uh, and mm -hmm. when I say students, I mean just. Uh, 
doesn't mean they are actually students, just students of learning specifically. Sure. So I, that means senior lighting artists, it, it can be, uh, we, I know a lot of 3D artists wanting to learn uh, lighting and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's just anyone who, who's looking to learn lighting specifically. Any yeah. advice for these kind of uh, learners on, on getting into improving on lighting? What are the three advices according to your uh, long experience that you would wish to uh, yeah. pass on? If you were to go back in time, I guess. <laughs> yeah, no, that's that. Those are man, those are great questions. Um, I'm trying to narrow it down to just three. I think um, so. Three things that I would say to make me a better lighting artist when I was first starting out would be number one is I would focus less on trying to watch software tutorials and learn software things and really focus on, on image making and, and really study art, composition, all that kind of stuff. And then, and then, um, so that, that would be one. And, and within that, like, it would be a lot of checking references. I didn't do enough reference work when I was younger. So it was like, when I would try and light uh, a living room, I would just be like, okay, I know what a living room looks like and go in there. But like, you really want to study a painting of a living room to see how, how an artist interprets the light. Uh, different photographs, how like the light bounces down and bounces up around the ceiling with the way the light wraps around things. What's the exposure difference between an inside room and a very, very bright outside? You know, it's not even that sunny out there, but that's crazy that it's that bright out there. Um, that's why I have curtains behind me. Yeah. Well, my room is just, it's just too dark. I, I could, yeah. I, if, if I shut them, it's a mess anyway. So, um, uh, so yeah, checking reference, uh, studying the art, the artistic side of things. I think, um, I think really, uh, a really big one is what we talked about earlier with critiquing, like making sure to get your work out there and getting it reviewed. And then the third thing that I would tell anybody is that just keep making stuff. It's going to be hard at first and you're not going to be as good at it at first as you want to be right. There's a, there's your eye and your desire to make good looking images develops way faster than your craft and your ability to make those images. So there's a gap there where, again, you're creating stuff that's not good enough and you don't know why, but just be patient with yourself. And this is even harder for senior artists and for, for people who've been doing this a while. Let's say you're learning a different, like let's say you're jumping into Unreal or you're jumping into learning something new. You're going to not be great at it at first. And it's going to like, there's going to be this feeling, especially if you've worked, let's say you've worked in Maya for 10 years and you're wanting to, to, in your, in your you know, trying to, to, to work in Houdini, let's say there's going to be this pull to go back to the familiar to, to, to just return to what you know. Uh, but, but fight through that a little bit and, and, and push yourself to, to learning the new stuff. Cause that, that real, that will kind of open you up a little bit. So I think, I think it's a lot of like, don't be afraid to fail and just keep going with it. I believe uh, Kat also earlier said, uh, I should love to say, yeah. fail fast. Fail fast. Yeah, we talked about that. It's like that 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 was a great one uh, that we were talking about the other day, which is like sometimes you a personal project, you just get into it and you're like, you know what? It's just not working. Like there's not, it's just, it's just not clicking. Uh, you in like, it's like you either recognize that and then you just like grind down and you really fight through it or you fail fast and you get the hell out of there and you, um, and you're like, you know what? I learned, I learned X, Y, and Z from this project. That makes it a success. I'm going to pencils down and go do something else. I'm saying no to that project so I can say yes to a different one. Right. That reminds me about, uh, this connects a little bit back to the feedback parts because uh, we haven't really covered that much mm -hmm. about this topic in any of my episodes here yet, is uh, a lot of people, when they especially because of technology and our Discord and, and those kind of accessibility of other people and other opinions and talent yeah. i see a lot of people post the same images including myself uh to different discord and you get opposing views and you get opposing opinion yeah. uh, and from my point of view i value all of them because there's something uh, sure. relevant to all of them because like there's someone is better at composition someone is better but a lot of it is also you know it can vary a little bit depending mm -hmm. on that because you said you would normally ask specific people right correct you yeah. people that you kind of know yeah. that that you you yourself believe know this stuff uh, but a lot of us also are will just post everywhere really and and get some opinion how do you 
what would you say to those kind of people who are doing that and how to deal with that uh, feedback? Because some of them, I think, can be a bit disheartening for some people mm -hmm. and also confusing. Because I remember a few years back when I started focusing on lighting specifically, I at least a few years ago was super confused. I did I took everything seriously. I got mm -hmm. confused. And my piece got worse because I was trying yeah. to take on too many opinions. Sure. What are your thoughts on this? I think I think that it is... Uh, I think I think the, the reason why I say that I, I do it with people that I know and uh, with the community that I know, I'll even do it with our students because I think they're they're great. But but for me, I I, I although we are extremely warm, uh, embracing community, I like to know that I like to have a relationship with the people because I, I know that they're um, that they're that they're looking out for what's best for me. Some people like online comments can be really tough sometimes. Right, because it can it can be, a, even even without the person intending it to be, it can be really aggressive, and it can feel like what you need to do with this shot is you need to make it better, and you're like, there's a lot of you statements in there that feels like a personal attack, and so, for, so I would I would start there that I I would I would agree, like I said, the the community we have at the Academy of Animated Art is very warm and very inviting. Um, the students that we have there are really great and we, we have a really nice pool there. So I think finding your community to, to critique within as opposed to just kind of like blanking, throwing it out there is, is, is it makes it a little bit better. Also understand that this is a subjective craft so that the, uh, the opinions that people give are going to take you in different directions based on their background, their styles, their history. Uh, so, so for me, it's all about taking every, uh, taking those more broad notes with a grain of salt, especially because they might not have the same vision you know, maybe you're trying to make something a little more stylized and they're like, well, in order for this to be more photorealistic, you need to do, you need to add this bump. And you're like, well, that's not really the style that I'm going for. So I think, I think it's a balance between, like you said, respecting where everyone's coming from because the different perspectives are important, but also having your end goal in mind so that you're like, you're like asking yourself, does making this alteration help me reach my end goal? Um, and that's like, like, like having a little bit of reference. So I think that's, that's a, that's a, long-winded answer to say uh you have to kind of take those with a little bit of a grain, grain of salt mm. to, to make sure that they're that they're going towards the vision that you want so what i started doing uh fun enough using kind of the wedge approach where i'm sharing one image with some subtle changes mm -hmm. uh to one group and then another to another group and i only take the the connecting feedback seriously so it's, yeah. if it's the same feedback on both images that i know it's, it's pretty serious and i need to do some updates yeah uh, otherwise i take it as a subjective um uh, opinion basically yeah and, and and there are two different types of notes too there are things that are technically wrong there's like hey it looks like that the layering is messed up on this thing that's that's just wrong so like that you know you should fix but then there then there's the subjective ones that are um that are yeah and it's like and if you do hear it from because because a lot of it too is just that you've been staring at it too long and, and getting in front of fresh eyes and people are like hey this like this person kind of feels lizard like and, and you hear that a couple times you're like oh 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 they've got this weird green light on them that's kind of taking away the warmth from their skin or something you know like it that is a good that i like that i like that idea of like if there's a little bit of a consensus that you should listen to that no yeah, definitely so did you mention all three tips? Let's see. I don't know if I, so uh, yeah, the three, the three tips I would give would be to use reference and understand that it's not about that, that learning lighting isn't about the software. It's about, about learning the craft and understanding that lighting is creating mood, uh, shaping your character, getting your character to pop off in the background. That would be, that would be one. Um, lighting tip number two would be the critiques and getting your feedback. Like we've been talking about. And, and making sure to put yourself out there. It's scary, but it's important. And then number three is to be patient with yourself during the process because it's hard and it takes a little while to get there. Yep, nice. So in terms of those uh, topics as well, um, would you say that there is a certain um, uh, challenge of dealing with feedback because i know a lot of people get emotional they get a bit aggressive yeah. if you give them feedback do you have any advice for those people who i don't think they're aware of it obviously but there are always some students there that i can yeah think, yeah, think yeah yeah, yeah. It, I, was, I was like i mean it was it's hard so so it's learning to um learning to separate yourself from the work and an understanding 
when, when people are, 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 are giving feedback, they're giving feedback on the work. They're not talking about you as an artist. They are talking about the work and they want the work to improve. It's this third, it's this third thing that you made that's outside of you. And I think th there's some responsibility on the, the person providing the feedback as well. I've studied this and, and work really hard at this, that when you're talking, I, I, when I give feedback, I like to talk about the, we, and like the collective, you know, say like, what we should do to make, to make this look better is we should, we should make this a little brighter. We should add some depth of field. I try it's because. Because if you say, okay, what, what, what you're doing here isn't working. What you need to do is what it's a you, 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 you. It all of a sudden becomes very like the you statements can be, can sometimes feel aggressive when you don't want them to be. Cause I do think of it as a collective process when I'm working with somebody to be like, this, this is what I think we should do to make things better. So I, there, there's a little bit of an onus on the person giving the feedback too. I also think I'm going to give something else. Sorry. Is Let's that I think that when you're giving feedback to that providing context is great. So I think that like, you know, if you're saying that it would be better if this character was, you know, if there was more contrast in this region, if you just left it at that, people would be like, all right, cool. But if you're like, I think there should be more contrast in the region, in this region, because this area of the image is actually closer in the foreground to the, to the viewer. And so we want to make that black point a little bit darker and that will allow the, black points behind it to be lifted a little bit. And then we're start to, starting to build depth in the image, right? So by having this contrast here, we're able to make it feel like the background is further away and the foreground is closer. Then it starts to click. So giving, giving people, it takes an extra second or so, but giving people the whys of the note and not just that, you know, I think it should be brighter. I think it should be darker is, is, right. is, a, is a really, really is a good way to get people to understand where you're going. Hmm. So, I'll ask you a similar question because we talked about three tips, but I'm curious to see if the same thing uh, falls under this uh, rephrase of this question is what are the couple of things that you feel you always have to tell most students, like the typical feedback? Like for me, an example would be it's it's very flat. It's like a typical uh of, of course, it's a very um, unhelpful comment that a lot of people do. I've noticed online, they just tell people it's flat. They don't explain yeah. what it means. I went through the yeah. same annoyance. People tell me <laughs> it's flat. I'm like, well, well, what does that mean? Someone tell yeah. me what does it mean? So are there some things that you notice that is, is a common uh, a common thing with all the students or most yeah. of the students? I think I think um, if it's flat, it's a big one. Yeah, so it's like <laughs> a lot of it is in the in the fill areas, right? It's getting too bright. Let me turn this down. But um, but one of, one of the things is I don't have much shadow here. But one of the things is that you know, like you'll <laughs> like, have you know, yeah, just... <laughs> you'll have you'll have like a key side of the face and the fill side of the face, right? And the fill side gets gets dark and the key side gets bright. What happens is this fill side gets flat because it's just it's just like just not just not the key light. So which a good thing that you do is you start to add specular lights in there to get some shaping in the specular values without that because you want it to be dark, right? You want it to not have that light but you want to create some shaping in there. So adding some specular values and, and keeping the diffuse down helps. Um, so yeah, like looking around the scene and really understanding that that is, is, is what's kind of needed throughout. Like, so shaping, yeah, things being too flat, that would be one. Um, number two is trying to do everything in the renderer. We, we told you get that sometimes too. And for me, it's like, like, and I learned this from photography. You want to take a photograph with, you want your negative to have the most value range in it you can get so that you can make adjustments in the print later. Digital photography, you want, you want the most value, you want, you want the most, uh, a file with, with a lot of rich values in it so that you can go, you can take it into Nuke or Photoshop and, and make the adjustments. Same thing with lighting. I think, I think that you're creating a lot in the renderer, but the ultimate image comes from building it in the composite. And so like, Anything that's like a 2D effect, anything that would happen on the surface of the lens, you know, like diffusion or light glow or edge wrap, that kind of stuff. I do that. Uh, I do that in in the comp, and you don't worry about it as much. And then um, you can really define it. So I, for me, a lot of it is like hitting the render button. That image pops out, and you're like, "Cool, I'm done." And it's like that's just that's just the next step you should but you should, that requires the other things we talked about having an eye as well because yeah. if you don't have the eye you wouldn't know uh, the difference yeah. between the raw image yeah. and and what's gonna happen afterwards right totally uh, fair. yeah right and then uh so that was two the third thing that i think that uh students 
need the most help with early on is I would say while you think about it yeah go ahead sorry I can, I, while you think about it i'll mention uh, one key difference between game lighting and and the, the what you just said just for the viewers is when we do game lighting uh, we we don't have a composite thing uh, part afterwards we have to do everything inside the render inside the game uh, if you can't do it you have to make tech for it or you just give up and say sorry can't do it so that's a that's definitely a very key thing and and, and different thing that i think uh, is good to point out um i think I, okay for the third one i will okay. say <laughs> i will say that the um uh, the third one is is really what I like to say, call directing the viewer's eye and getting the audience to look where we need them to in an image. So often a student who like will assemble a scene will light it in a way that kind of illuminates everything because they spent time building this thing. And you're like, okay, what's our, what, what do you want us to, if we only had one second, like what do you want us to see in this shot? And then, and then you start to like, okay, well, we need to make these areas darker. Even though I know you spent a lot of time modeling that, that's going to be out of focus or that's going to be in the dark areas and we need to kind of get 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 the bright areas in there so cool. i think i think like really focusing and centering the image uh so we're gonna do one question from the audience before mike has to move on so the question is uh how long have you i want to just ask you how long yeah. have you been in the world in the industry and uh, does any study that you've worked with in the past or currently use blender for lighting or just use blender in general so uh i'll let you address it yeah so i've been working in the industry for probably it's like 15 years now and then uh, in terms of Blender, I think Blender is an incredible tool. It's a great community. It has not come up in any of my workflows at the companies that I've, I've worked at. Um, mostly because it's, it's a great personal tool. It just doesn't, it's not as adjustable into a workflow as some of the other tools are. Like it's not, there's not like a lot of scripting that you can do to, to have it, to customize it, to have it fit into a pipeline. Will that change? Probably. I think I think it'll 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 probably get more. Also, companies are reluctant um, with a free tool because we've seen tools just disappear so many times. Uh, um, and so and so, Blender being this like, although it's very well supported and all that stuff, like it, it being a free tool, it could like they could just you know the, they could just stop working on it at any time, and it would be a very low cost for them. Um, but I think yeah. But I, I think Blend, I think Blender is a very very cool tool. Other than oh, also I've se I have seen it used for like quick visualization stuff. In some cool, yeah. cool. Uh, I'll give a short answer to you. Uh, Total. I started in two thousand nine, but I started as a producer and game designer, not actually artistically. So I went uh, all over the place. Uh, so I want to thank you, Michael, for your time. I know you're in a hurry. Uh, <laughs> I might ask you to do another session in the future because I kind of yeah. think there's there's a lot of things we can cover together actually. Sure. Uh, so. Um, a reminder for everyone, uh, we do have a portfolio review at uh, our uh, servers. We do have a community highlight where we show uh, people who just post stuff, basically. We do have Unreal tutorials for free on YouTube. We do have Unity tutorials for free on YouTube. We offer uh, game mentorship for lighting as well. And uh, keep watching our uh, content. There's tons. This is the biggest library uh, of uh, lighting artists and compositors on the internet now. So, you know, stay tuned for more content. And then, Michael, really, I appreciate your yeah. knowledge and your time. And I, I do hope I can ask you for another session, another sure. time when sure. you have yeah, the opportunity. So uh, I'm going to leave you to it and say let's say goodbye to everyone. Thank you for watching, everyone. And and have a good day, Michael, as well. And I think you have a review session or something, I yeah, guess. Yeah, so. I got something in a little while. So Academy of Animated Art students, get, get on it. I'll see you guys in about an hour. Yeah, so you can find uh, you can find a link for his uh, stuff uh, on our description as well. So you can uh, you know join, go into the Discord, uh, no problem. So All thank right. you. Thank you <laughs> guys. Nice Talk to you soon. Bye. Bye.